a preacher and a debt collector walk into a church. Both men come with the intention to pray. Both men come with requests for God. But there is a significant difference between the two men. The preacher walks up front where everyone can see and hear him. Thank you, Lord God, that I am a preacher, and I'm not like them. Thank you that I'm not a bigoted white cop that beats black people. Thank you that I'm not a black person who causes riots and devastation. Thank you that I'm not a person who keeps other women. Thank you for your rules and your laws that I keep to the T. I do so, so much that I give more than that is required, and I fast more than what is necessary. And I thank you most that I'm not like that debt collector. The debt collector, slumped in the back of the church, clearly remorseful, simply says, I'm sorry for what I've done. Have mercy on me, O God. Which of these men go from church justified? Is it the debt collector? It is the debt collector. Because all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. That is a maybe a contemporary modern rendition of the story that comes to us from Luke's gospel in chapter 18 about the Pharisee and the debt collector that go, that go to pray. And it is there that, that Jesus is, is teaching his, his followers a little bit of how to be, how it is that you, you are to be and your actions and the good deeds that, that you do. Jesus is, is teaching the people about how it is you are to do those things. And he's also, he's also teaching his disciples, how, how to pray. And that's what we are talking about. And, and so often when Jesus teaches, he, he takes, he takes what we think is right and good and he just seems to flip it upside down. He just seems to turn what we would naturally think is, is right into that which is really right according to his, to his truth. And, and in this case, it is, it's this it's this perception about people that Jesus is is teaching uh, his his disciples because clearly there there was a perception that people would have about the religious person the the, the preacher in this get or or in in Jesus story the the Pharisee the the religious leader would have held a perception among among the people similarly there was also a perception about the debt collector or or the tax collector at the time and Jesus seems to take those two perceptions and flip them on their backs a little bit you know tax collection and debt collection that's that's a necessary thing that it needs to it needs to get done it has it has to happen if there are debts that need paid then they need to be paid if there's debts that need to be paid now they they need to be paid it's a necessary thing but the perception of that person in this story was was kind of kind of negative, and you probably understand a little bit because a lot of that negativity comes from people that probably owe, you know, and that's probably where, you know, the debt collectors and the tax collectors get get the the, the bad rap. It's from it's from people that owe money, and you know, and now here someone's coming to settle those 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 accounts. And and truly, we know as well that there. Are, uh, were then and probably now ta- uh, tax collectors, debt collectors that are that are crooked. You, you know, we know that that was some that was happening during the time of Christ's teaching that that they were they were taxing more than they were to tax and they were collecting more than they were to collect. And guess where it was going? It was going in their pockets. And so there was a there was a little bit of that. You know that one bad apple can kind of kind of spoil the whole group. Similarly. The religious leader would have probably been looked at with very high regard, you know, because that's what religious people are su- supposed to do then and, and maybe now, that they are perhaps held at some, some high, high standard. And, you know, people 
perhaps sometimes can look and say, who possibly could be as good as that man in his robe and, and, and doing all of, all of that that he's, do, that he's doing? So there were, there were perceptions that, that were there. And unfortunately, what happens, you get kind of the exception to the rule on each case here, and it sort of taints the perception of the whole group. We don't have any of that going on right now, do we, in our, in our culture? Uh, think of law enforcement. You know, you have a few bad apples in law enforcement, and you've got a whole bunch of people that say all law enforcement's bad. Similarly, you have people of color that are doing something, and people that are not of color think that whole group group, group of people uh, are always de- demolishing and destroying and being uh, lawbreakers. You know, so nothing, nothing new there. But Jesus takes this situation where the general perception of the debt collector and the Pharisee, and he, and he flips it. Because who was most genuine when they came to church or came to the temple? Who was the person that was in the correct position before God was not the one that was expected? Clearly, as the story started off, he would have thought, okay, here's the religious guy. He knows how to pray. He knows how to relate with God. And here comes this other guy all slumped over and won't even, won't even come into the church, you know. They know who was the one that would no doubt be the person who would have the correct position and the correct attitude, but it wasn't, it wasn't the one. It was the debt collector's heart that was the one that was right. Scripture says in that passage that he, that he beats his breast and he can't even come forward. And this, this beating of the breast, it's a physical sign of the times to show humility and shame of what they have done and, and, and aspects of their life that they just, you know, can't even come to God. And it is there that this person in his humility is, is requesting divine favor. He's coming to God and pleading for, for mercy. And so Jesus is teaching that. He's flipping this story over. That that's, that's how you should act. It shouldn't be all this showy stuff. It needs to be this rendering of the of the heart and and understanding who it is you are and the, the, our shortcomings that we have that was obviously seen and shown by our, our debt collector but he's also he's also showing showing his his disciples a little bit about about prayer you know we saw two different prayers here and Jesus says this is the one this is the one that was most right it isn't someone coming up and saying, I'm so thankful that I'm not this person and not this person and I don't have these sins. Thank you that I'm not one of those. It is a prayer more like what the debt collector shared. And the disciples want to know more about prayer. You know, they want to know more about this. We talked a little bit about this last week because they just so often saw Jesus go off in solitude and pray. He'd go to the mountainside and he would pray alone. And then Jesus would, would tell them things that, boy, they're kind of some, they make you think a little bit. You know, Jesus, Jesus says this, you know, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Well, if I was a disciple and heard that, that would catch my ear just a bit because that's a pretty profound statement to make. Or similarly, in Mark, Jesus answered his disciples again, said, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Again, I think that would have been a statement that if I was a disciple in that crowd, I thought, that'd be kind of cool. I'd like to say to that mountain, go jump in the sea. That'd be, that'd be kind of a neat thing to do. So no doubt the, the disciples as they're at the feet of Christ and hearing, hearing him begin to talk about prayer, they want to know how to pray. They, they want to know how it is to do that. How is it we can, we can do it correctly and do it, to do it right and to be effective about your prayers? You know, you ever, you ever think about that in, in your walk? You know, it seems like I pray a lot, but it just doesn't seem like there, there are results. I just don't feel like I'm effective in my prayer. And I think that would have been at the heart of the question that the disciples asked Jesus when they asked him, Lord, Lord would you just teach us, would you just teach us to pray? And so he did. And it probably went something like this. And when thou prayest... 
Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, we chart in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, Lord, teach us to pray the disciples, uh, disciples asked Jesus. And, and there's a reenactment, perhaps, of what that would have looked like with his disciples. And, you know, is that a question that you have as well? Lord, Lord, teach me to pray. T- teach me to pray better. Uh, I want to be your follower that is better at prayer. And I think that is a question we probably all would answer, well, well, yeah, and we're never going, I don't believe, be perfect prayers. I think this is, uh, this is something that we will get better at as, as we grow in our faith. And so we take time out here for us to ask that question to God as well. Lord, how is it we, we should pray? How is it that we can be a church whose foundation is in prayer, that is seeking you out in the right way to find what it is that you would have for us and what it is that we can do. And we learn that through through prayer. And so we're going to look at what Jesus' answer to the disciples was. How is it we should pray? And you and you saw what he said there, and he and he ended that teaching with what we now call the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to look at that for the next few weeks and and look a little more closely at those words that you and I have been saying for (laughs) decades that we say over and over uh, again here and perhaps in your own personal lives as well. The Lord's Prayer comes to us from two different passages in the Bible, one from from Luke and one from from Matthew. And the version that we get that we say, uh, it's actually not exactly uh, like what we say in the Bible. It probably comes closest to the version that we get out of Matthew chapter 6. And we have it, we have it on, on the screen there. Uh, some, and and it, bends, it depends on the translation too. If you have access to different uh, translations of the Bible, like a new uh, living Bible, a new international Bible, a King James Bible, if you have those and you look this up, they, they vary a little bit. In fact, that last part that we say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, uh, that's really not in um, the earliest versions of the text of the Bible that we have. That was, that was an ad that was a little, bit, uh, a little bit later. And it's only found in the King James Version of Matthew and, and chapter 6. And the version that Ashley read, it was a little bit different as well. It was a little shorter. Um, some, some of the words were left out. So here... Here it is, we, we have that uh, Lord's Prayer as it comes from Matthew in, in chapter 6. And some of the things that I wanted you to notice, um, some of the words I have highlighted up there, I think kind of in yellow. You know, words like thy and thine and art and hallowed. Those aren't words that I would guess when you go from here and you're sitting at uh, your dinner table, that those are words you probably don't use. They're, they're kind of words that we reserve and use in prayer. And, and then even some other words, uh, s- such as, you know, talking about heaven and, and kingdom and God's will. 
uh, and to talk about daily bread and temptation and, and forgiveness. Those are kind of they're kind of religious church only words as well. They're not they're not words that are commonly used as we normally would go about go about our, our talk. But we do that, I think, you know, for the, the, the purpose of speaking in a way that's, that's other. That when we pray that prayer, we, we are kind of drawn to doing it in a, in a way that's different than we normally would speak. It's other, or it's holy, or it's reverent, or it's sacred. It's set apart for something kind of special in the Lord's Prayer. And I think that's why... We keep that older, that older. I, I even found kind of a, you know, a King James looking font up there that kind of makes it look a little cooler, you know, than regular, just Times Roman stamp up there, you know. I want to make it look a little other, you know. There's something, there's something right about that, you know. But that is the prayer. And if we, one of the, one of the overlooking things I, I, that, that I'd like you to see here is, uh, the prayer starts off and there are seven petitions or seven things that, that are asked that Jesus refers us to. Seven of them. The first three are about God and, and to God. You know, God, we, we want your name to be hallowed. We want your kingdom to come. We want your will to be done. This prayer starts off with God first and our requests later. And remember Jesus told us this is the manner in which you pray. I think that's one of the first things that we can learn about this prayer. Our prayer should start off first by focusing on Him and not our stuff. You know, it doesn't always work that way. You know, hey, dear God, can you take care of this, this, and this, and this, and this for me? (laughs) We do that an awful lot. If you look at the pattern of our prayers sometimes, we go right away to the things that we think we need. But this prayer starts off, these seven petitions start off, and the first three are directed at Him about hallowing his name and knowing that it's about his will and it's about his kingdom. That's, that is our focus. And then after that, these are the things that Jesus said that, that we, sh- we should ask for. And this is where it turns more self-centered. Give, give to us our, our daily bread. Forgive us. Allow us not to go into temptation and, and deliver us from, from evil. Those are things that we are requesting of, about us. And I think that's... That's one of the things that we should notice here about prayer that we probably could take away and learn as we become better prayers as we start by honoring and glorifying God first. And then our petitions for ourselves come second. And Jesus gave this prayer to those disciples as a manner to pray. Pray like this, he says. After this manner... Pray this way. Or another translation says, just pray this way. It isn't about just saying that sequence of, of words together. It, it, this is, this is a, a model or a form for, for us to use. In fact, just before then, he says, when you're praying, this comes from verse 7, do not heap up empty phrases as, as the Gentiles. Or another translation says, vain repetitions as the heathens do. He doesn't want us just repeating words. He doesn't want us just regurgitating these words in, in order with some magical hope that this is, this is some perfect formula that's going to let us into some, some secret place or some exclusive place that I, if I just would say 10 our fathers, then I can go ask him for some stuff. Can you make my life better? I just did my 10 our fathers. That isn't what he is, is saying that this this prayer should, should, be, should be used for. Our Father who art in heaven. You know, I say that 15 times, and now would you please take care of my kids? You know, it, it, that, isn't, that isn't the direction. The purpose of the, the prayer here is to be used as a pattern. Now, is there anything wrong with us praying that verbatim like we do? Well, no, I think it's, I think it's a wonderful thing that we do in our homes uh, is a prayer that we can do together. It's a wonderful thing we do as a church. Every week we've been doing that prayer together, except the last couple I cut it out because I want you to appreciate it a little bit. We're not going to do it for a little bit. But it's a great thing that we do because it is this prayer that we can say together and it just emphasizes this body, this community of Pleasant Chapel. So let's, let's look at these, the, these phrases a little bit and let's think a little bit about these words that we are 
to model after. Our Father, which art in heaven, the first phrase that's there. Our Father. Our Father. I did a, I did a count in all of Matthew about how many times Jesus referred to God as, as our Father. You're looking at it. It's right there. That is the one time. But 15 other times he talks about my Father. And and he says this uh, a lot of different ways. For example, you'll recognize these. You know, Lord, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Fifteen times he uses the word, the words, my Father. But now when the disciples ask him to pray, he says, pray this way. He says, our Father. And I think that's just awesome because to me what that is doing is that's now bringing the disciples into this very exclusive group, which is Jesus and the Father. He is now your Father as well, and you can now pray as our Father. What a great thing. That's the one time that he says that there. And I think that's just a beautiful first piece for his disciples that would have just maybe done a, how cool is that? We've heard him pray so many times to my father and his father. And now we can now address the father as our father. We have that right and that ability to be able to do that. And our is plural. You know, Jesus didn't say it's okay to say my father. And he is. He is. Each of us and the disciples would have been their individual father. But he said, don't pray that way. Pray using the plural, our Say it that way as our, because that, again, reminds us (laughs) of what we have come to know so much the last few months here at Pleasant Chapel is just this awesome thing that we have as us, as Pleasant Chapel, as you and I together, as our. Because that is, is how we are to relate to God, as the plural, as our. There is an implied togetherness when we... When we pray, we're not alone. We're not alone. Loneliness is one of the most horrible things we can, we can have as human beings here. But when we say our Father, well, the first one is we're not alone because we're praying to God and He's there to begin with, our Father. We're not alone. But we're also not alone because we are surrounded by the others in this word, our all of these brothers and sisters in Christ that you, you and I have who are with us together in this journey that we have together as, as humans. You know, I think, too, that the Christian faith, it, it's such a wonderful equalizer. Because when we say our Father, we're bringing in, yeah, our families, we're bringing in Pleasant Chapel, we're bringing in the universal church throughout the world into that word, our And faith is such an equalizer because it doesn't matter at all about your wealth. And it doesn't matter at all about your abilities. And it doesn't matter at all about your education or your status or your power or your race or your gender or your orientation or your age or any of your abilities. We're one in Christ. We are our together. And it's such a wonderful equalizer that we are all brought together equally as followers of Christ. And we're reminded of that when we start that prayer with our Father. We're all born humans. We're all created by Him. And as followers of Christ, we know that we are born of His Spirit when our sins were forgiven. But, you know, we have to remember as well that when we say our Father, that we are automatically making an exclusive club a little bit. Our Father. We're talking about those who have received the forgiveness of Christ. Those are the ones that can say our Father. And we need to know that that is exclusive a bit because there are others that cannot be included into the our yet. Their spirits are dead. They have not received the forgiveness that Christ offers. And we acknowledge that not, you know, to think about we are this elite group who is, 
you know, we, we're the in crowd and there's not the in crowd. That's not what that is about. We need to be reminded that there are people who cannot call the Father our Father because they've not received that. That needs, that needs to serve as, as a challenge for us, the hour, to do what it is that, that we can do to expand this fellowship to other people. We need to get as many people who can claim the Father as their, their Father as well. We need to be reminded of that because there are so many of people that just right next door, right next door to all of us, that need to come to know Him and to become connected to God. Father. Jesus uses the word Father. He didn't use God. He didn't use His holiness. He uses the word Father. And we have this notion then of of family. All of us derive our very beings from from our father and from our mother. And so we have this family feeling. And I think that would have been such a wonderful thing for those disciples to hear that. Because it it just implies this this personal relationship that we have. Our, Our father. There is both... Love from the best of our earthly fathers we can have, the best of the fathers. We know that there's the source of fatherly love that is is there, and that's what's being implied here. But also there is this orderness of that. If he's the father, we are the child. And there is a subordination of that that we have to be reminded of, too. He's the boss and I'm not. Our, you are the father and I, I am the child. Which art in heaven. You know, what an unthinkable, unfathomable idea that we have access to heaven. I don't know that we could ever fully, fully appreciate that. But when we say our Father which art in heaven, we are talking to our Father who is in heaven. We are, we are in this spiritual realm and have access to, to heaven. We are spiritually in, in, in heaven when, when we pray that. And I just can't, you know, that's just phenomenal to me. Because I think about how big the universe is. If you were here a few weeks ago, we talked about, remember we talked about that nearest planet. And if we could get there, it would take us, I don't know what it was, 3,600 years. If we'd get in the fastest rocket ship, we could get there, you know. And that's the closest one. I read this week they found another one. That, that planet was just four light years away, and it would take us 3,600 years to get there. And they're so excited they found another one that's 3,000 light years away. <laughs> we just can't. That's the universe. You, you know, that's all of this physical stuff. We just can't wrap our minds around that. And yet beyond that, superseding that is, is heaven. And when we speak to our Father, which art in heaven, we are there. We are, we are in this Wonderful dynamic that we are speaking to him in heaven. Our Father, when we, when we say that, it, 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 it speaks about the nearness of God. He's right here. We can speak to him and he is right here. And then yet when we talk about in heaven, that tells us about this, reminds us about this tremendous distance that there is and, and the just tremendous awe that we ought to have of, of God that we can speak to someone in this vast vastness of what it is that we know and what then follows from that is just sheer reverence and awe that you and I can participate in heaven through prayer you and I have this access to this realm this spiritual realm right now when we pray and yet we know and we're reminded that it's not complete we can speak to God in heaven now and that's a wonderful thing but we know that there's a completion that's yet to come And we know that there will be a time when we will see him face to face and we won't have this separation as as we do now. Our Father, which art in heaven. Just some simple, simple words that we have there. But when you contemplate on those and when you think about those, to me it just, it, it opens my eyes up a bit to what prayer is and what it should be. And the tremendous power and, and privilege that we have in prayer. It is awesome that you and I can, can access God in heaven through, through prayer. We've been given that privilege. Our prayers should begin first by bringing Him glory. 
the first words that should come out of our mouths and all of our prayers according to this model is to bring Him glory and to praise Him for who He is. And then we have the privilege of bringing our request. Our implies that we are in this together. What a great thing we have. This, that we are a community of believers that are here to support each other through whatever good things and whatever bad things we have, that we are a body of Christ. And we're reminded in that when we pray. He is our Father, which tells me He's close and He loves and He cares for me. But He's the authority and I am the child. So your homework for the week, I still got a little bit of teaching gene in me here a little bit. So for tomorrow, I'd like for you to do this assignment. Those four points in your bulletin there about some takeaways that we have regarding just those first few lines of prayer. And I'd like for you to think about those things and think a little bit about how you may change your prayer reflecting what we talk about here. This church is not short of things to pray for this week. I will tell you that right now. we got plenty to pray for, so I'm going to give you plenty of opportunity to practice a little bit of prayer. So how is it then that we as a church could begin to be better prayers right now because of listening to the manner in which Christ taught us to pray? Let's do that. Let us stand and we will close with a prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for who, for who you are. We're reminded once again of how great you are, how much glory that you will forever deserve. We're reminded of your tremendous power that you demonstrate through, through all, of, all of creation. We are grateful that we can come to you and I can speak for this group together as our as us, as this church. Our church comes to you today to bring you praise and to bring you glory. We thank you that we can, as a church, lift, lift our concerns up to you. We're grateful as a body that we can support one another in, in times of joy and in times of sorrow and in times of trouble. And Lord, you know that this week, no doubt, has supplied us with plenty of opportunities for just that. Allow us to now go. Let us be energized and empowered by your Holy Spirit as we would leave this place and be your light into this dark world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful and safe week.